Today, we're lowering our 1993 Silverado to get the right stance. Then we're shoeing it with some larger and more modern wheels and tires. This is their Azenus FK line. It's all today here on Truck Tech. Hey, thanks for watching Truck Tech. Well, this is our 1993 full size 1500 series two wheel drive short bed Chevy pickup with 260,000 miles on the clock. And although it might look exactly the same as the last time you saw it, we've actually been working hard on it, making sure that the brakes work when we hit the pedal, making sure that it doesn't pee out fluids every time it's parked, and making sure that it runs good enough so that where we can get some more miles out of it. Now, this body style stayed virtually the same from 1988 right up until about 1999, making it arguably the next current classic. And although we think it's a good looking body style, there's always room for improvement. Now, aesthetically speaking, there's a couple of things this truck is screaming for. A paint job and an improved stance. Now, we've done some lowering kits before, but they've always been in the moderate range. So this time we're going to get a little bit more aggressive because why would we lift up a two wheel drive truck and throw some big old mud tires on it? We want to make a nice clean street truck. Now, to get our truck sitting closer to the pavement, we just went to the Summit Racing website, entered in our make and model, and took a look at some of the options they had available. We settled on a 5.6 lowering kit, which is going to give us 5 inches of drop up front and 6 inches at the back of the truck. Now, to get that done up front, it uses a combination of lowering springs and drop spindles. Out back, since we want 6 inches of drop, we have to do something aggressive. So we went with a flip kit, which is going to move the leaf springs from the top of the axle, where they are now, to the bottom of the axle. And that necessitates a C-notch of the frame, just so you can maintain a little bit of suspension travel. And these suckers will bolt in. We also went to Summit and picked up four new shocks that will match our soon-to-be lowered ride height. Now, even being able to throw a socket onto the ball joint castle nuts, well, it was like an archaeological dig. We had to hunt and peck to even find the cotter pins. Hey, there it is. My guess is this truck spent some time on a cattle ranch. Despite the miles on this truck, the ball joints were still in pretty good shape. So we didn't want to use the pickle fork and the impact gun on them. We wanted to keep the boots intact. So we used the tried old true method of whomping it with a BFH. One, right then, there it is. Now, if you're just doing a mild drop with just springs, you still have to take the spindles off. Ours is pretty aggressive, so the spindles get replaced as well as the spring. Now, to allow the control arm to swing down far enough to have access to the coil spring, we're removing the sway bar end links. I'm also disconnecting the bottom half of the shock so I can climb up in the engine bay and remove the stud nut and remove the shock altogether. Go up top, loosen up that shock. But sometimes these parts store shocks don't come off like you expect them to. <laughs> That shock just came apart, didn't it? Yeah. That's hilarious. So you wanted a $19 shock. <laughs> Something missing here. Something's missing, all right. <laughs> well, I guess there's more than one way to remove a shock. All right, now the only thing we've got left to do is to remove the coil spring, and we can do that by lowering this jack. I've done this enough on this particular model of truck to know that this spring isn't under that much of a compression load and I'd probably be okay just keeping a firm hand on it and using a pry bar to pry the bottom of the spring out. But just to be safe, I've got to link the chain, run down through the spring and the lower control arm so it can't go very far and won't become a temporary part of my face or rib gauge. And with the jack out of the way, we can use a pry bar to gently pry the spring out of its seat. Chain worked. Now to make sure our little rubber coil spring isolator doesn't go anywhere during installation, a couple of pieces of masking tape ought to keep it pinned down. And once you have the spring in place, make sure you index it correctly so that the end of the spring sits in the little recess on the bottom of the control arm pocket. 
Then you can use the jack to put a little bit of pressure on the spring and compress it enough so you can install the spindle and shock. Shock in there, we're good. Now our replacement shock is one of these fancy newfangled one-piece shocks. Now we did have a captured nut break free on the inside of the control arm, so we just use a nut and bolt to replace it. Good thing this isn't a show truck. You can follow that with the installation of the new drop spindle from Magoy's. Just tighten down the castellated nuts and secure them with cotter pins. Now the drop spindle provides about two inches of drop. And if you take a look and compare them to the original, the spindle pin height is about two inches higher, letting the truck sit lower to the ground. After a quick cleanup and a little bit of paint, we reinstalled the brake dust shield and our new rotors. Then installed the outer wheel bearing, set the preload on the rotors, secured it with a cotter pin, and covered everything up with a dust cap. Then we reinstalled our high mileage but still functioning brake calipers, secured the bolts, then finally added the tie rod end and locked it down into place. But we stopped short of adding the sway bar end links because we've got another upgrade in mind. We'll get to that later. Coming up, how to lower the rear end by C-notching the frame. Okay, cool. And later, U-joint rebuilding tips. Hey, welcome back. We are in the middle of dropping the suspension on our full-size Chevy pickup, doing a pretty aggressive 5.6 drop. Now, out front, you'd think with all the steering and geometry business going on that it would be a lot more work to drop it in the front. Well, not so much. It may be more complicated, but certainly not more work. In the back, we're doing essentially what is known as a flip kit, which is putting the axle over top of the leaf spring pack quite simple operation. However, it creates another problem, which is suspension travel here. So we have to do some sort of a relief on the frame rail. It's a dual parallel section of frame rail, not too bad, but we have to have access to it. So we're going to essentially blow everything apart, get access to everything all at once, and do the kit the smart way. Now thinking ahead, we want to fix the rusty cab corners and the bed has to be off for that. So loosening all the hardware, well it just makes sense and it saves us time down the road. The rest of teardown, it's fairly simple. And even though there's 260,000 miles on this truck, it has been worked on in the past. So these fasteners aren't rusted or frozen in. Now those of you Chevy truck eagle-eyes out there, you've probably noticed that we've got mismatched U-bolts and non-stock rear shackles. So this truck's been into before, and it may give us too much drop in the back. We'll just have to figure it out later. Here you can clearly see the non-stock shackles that are obviously a couple of inches longer than they should be. But the multiple bolt locations may solve the problem before it's even a problem. Sweet. All right, with the axle out of the way and the frame rail cleaned up a little bit, went ahead and marked the holes for the C-notch. Now to do that, I just used the C-notch plates as a template. Mark the holes that needed to be drilled, eight of them, plus mark the C-notch where it's gonna go. And before we start cutting the C-notch, we're gonna drill a couple of holes on these inside corners just for a little uh, extra strength. Now, just like any time you drill into a frame rail, you need to check the back side of it to make sure you're not gonna run into any wiring harnesses fuel lines or brake lines. Now the purpose of the holes on the inside of these corners is to prevent a stress location where two straight edges meet and could potentially lead to a stress crack or fatigue crack. The drilled hole provides a nice smooth radius and will hopefully prevent that. Now we're using a 40,000 thick cutoff wheel that we picked up from Industrial Depot on our four and a half inch angle grinder. But you can use a reciprocating saw and achieve the same results. Our cutoff wheel got us through both frame rails. Now, if you're doing this at home, make sure you support the back end of the frame rails before you make your cut to make sure that the frame rail doesn't move around on you once you remove half the metal. That way, you can bolt the C-notch back in place and lock it into position nice and straight. 
And with the frame rail carved up, go ahead and throw the C-notch plate back in position and verify that the holes you marked are in the right spot. We're good, ready to drill. Yeehaw. We started out with eighth inch pilot holes just to make sure the hole was centered and makes things easier for us to drill. Then we jumped up to about a 5 16 bit, followed by a half inch bit. Now you can go straight to the half inch bit if you want to. For me, it's a little bit easier and a little bit quicker to step it up. Then I just knocked the burrs down on the end of the holes so the C-notch plate fit nice and flush. And since we don't want this raw steel rusting any more than the steel that's around it, we wiped it down with a little acetone and got rid of any last remaining metal splinters and hit it with a coat of paint just to make sure corrosion stayed at bay. Now the plate gets bolted in place with eight grade eight fasteners on the face of it, along with two of them on the bottom side of the frame rail, one on either side of the notch. We got a little bit of work to do on that one. And for you guys that are concerned with cutting into the frame rail this much, well, don't worry about it too much because this plate builds a lot of that strength back into it. Okay, cool. C-notch complete. Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Well, we're just about done installing the lowering kit on our 93 Chevy. And since we had the drive shaft out to install the rear axle flip kit, we figured now would be a good time to replace some of these high mileage and worn out U-joints. Now we've shown you U-joint replacement in the past, but I don't think we've shown you this GM style that isn't held in place by circlips, but held in place by nylon. That takes a little bit of heat to remove. Now you can use an oxyacetylene torch if you want the job to go a little bit quicker, but these propane torches are about 15 bucks. What the flame does is heat up the yoke, which in turn heats up the nylon or plastic that locks the U-joint caps in place, forcing it to expand and forcing it out of the hole or chamber that it's locked into. Now a little WD-40 will help lubricate the caps so they slide out of position a little easier. There we go. My guess is it's a little warm. Now you might have noticed I'm using a nut from one of the old rear axle U-bolts to drive on the bottom of the U-joint and help push the top cap out. There we go. Just better than using a chrome socket. <laughs> That's kind of ridiculous. Just like a new one. Wow. Yep. Cool. Out with the old, in with the new. Now you can see the location of the groove in the stock cap versus the replacement. It's in a different spot and it's made to fit this replacement C clip. Now to install the joint, first carefully remove U-joint caps on either side and slide one half at a time of the U-joint into the yoke. Then with the U-joint cross protruding from the yoke, install one of the caps, making sure the needle bearings are all still in the correct position. Then flip the joint over and slightly tap on the yoke to make sure that the cap starts seating in the yoke. And once it's tapped in a little bit, then you can flip it over and repeat the process. Again, making sure that the needle bearings all stay in position. If one falls out of position and ends up in the bottom of the cap, well, you're never gonna get the clips to seat and the U-joint's gonna fail prematurely if you do somehow manage to. Now there's grease pre-installed from the factory and that helps hold the needle bearings in place, which is always good to keep an eye on it. I'm just using one of the old caps to help drive the new cap into position. Once I've got it seated, I'm gonna break out the noise maker and slowly vibrate it into place. It might take a few seconds, but better than whooping on it with a big hammer. Now, once you get one U-joint cap fully into position, go ahead and install one of the C-clips. That way you can drive against that cap and the clip 
to make sure everything's installed correctly and all the way. Then flip it over, press the other side cap all the way in position, making sure that the groove for the C-clip is fully exposed. Install the C-clip and you're done. Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Now our recently lowered Chevy is back on all fours and looking pretty good. Now we can't do anything immediately about this old two-tone paint job, but one thing we can do right now to improve the looks of this truck is swap out the rolling stock. Now take a look at what we're going to replace those tired old wheels with. These are from KMC. We picked them up at Summit Racing. It's a matte black finish. They call it their Addict Wheel. And it's a 20 inch diameter, 9 inches wide with a 5 and 3 quarter inch backspace. This is a cast aluminum wheel that's going to really bring the look of this truck into the 21st century and look a whole lot better. We've got them wrapped in Falcon tires that are equally as cool. Check it out. That one seems to have a mind of its own, so we'll show you this guy instead. This is their Azenus FK line in a 295 40 series 20 inch diameter wheel. This is Falcon's answer to today's growing market of performance luxury crossovers and SUVs full size truck tires. It's available in a wide variety of diameters from 17 to 20 inches, including staggered. Now, this tire features a performance oriented asymmetric tread design for great traction and handling. Now, Falcon claims to have a silica-enhanced formula in the rubber that improves performance and eliminates some of the road noise. We're going to test them out on our truck, see how they perform. All right, with our wheels installed, well, this truck is just a paint job away from looking like something we would actually want to drive. But before we paint it, we got to get rid of some more of this trim and do a little rust repair. That's right, so the next time you see this truck, we'll take care of some of the tin worm issues that plague this body style. Now, just about every shop out there has one thing in common, the need for some sort of shop towel or rag to clean up with. And in most shops, real estate is a premium. So being able to hang your Scott Pro shop towels up on a pegboard not only gets them off the floor or off of a tabletop, it makes grabbing a shop towel a one-handed deal. And we've shown you and told you how tough these Pro shop towels are. And the new box is just a simple design that allows it to be installed on a pegboard for convenience. So if you've got a pegboard, well check out Scott Pro Shop Towels and their box that's made just for it. If you guys are finally done with burning up spark plug boots on your engine, you might want to check a set of these Axel Extreme 9000 ceramic booted universal fit spark plug wires. The wires themselves are a silicone spiral wound ultra high temperature 8 millimeter wire and the kit comes with both traditional and HEI distributor boots. But the real magic is in the ceramic boots which offer up to 600 degrees Fahrenheit of heat resistance. These Axel ceramic booted plugs are perfect for a close proximity high heat application such as a turbo supercharger or even a heavy duty truck and are available wherever Axel products are sold. Now, if you've got an 07 or newer Jeep JK Wrangler and you want to replace the kind of weak stock bumper with something a little bit more substantial or something styled more aggressively, then check out the Extreme Stinger Bumper from Paramount Restyling. This heavy-duty steel bumper is precision cut and powder coated black. It's got an integrated winch mount, heavy-duty tabs, and D-rings that are included and it's designed to maximize clearance while off-road. So if you want to toughen up the front end of your JK Wrangler with something that's functional and aggressive looking, well check out the Extreme Stinger from Paramount Restyling. Guys, thanks for watching Truck Tech. See you in a little bit.